Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Funsho Aye Gina, and I'm the Deputy Festival Director, Bokas Lit Fest. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you here. There are a number of facilitators in the audience that I want to quickly acknowledge because without them, we can't do what we are doing. Uh, I want to acknowledge the presence of the uh, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Keith Rowley. But I want to state right from the word go that I am holding a conversation with Dr. Kit Rowley, not with the Prime Minister. I'm holding a conversation with the, Dr. Kit Rowley, who is the author, the writer of From Mason Hall to White Hall. So that's the, the first ground rule I want to uh, lay down. Uh, I want to acknowledge the presence in the audience of the, chair, um, uh, the, the chairman of NGC, um, Mr. Ger Jerry C. Brooks. You all know that NGC is our title sponsor, and without them, we can't do nothing. <laughs> and so, <laughs> NGC, we, we also have the director of NGC in the audience, Mr. Sham Mahabia, and we'd like to uh, thank them for coming. Uh, to, uh, to, this, uh, to this event. Those of you who have been here whole day um, must have noticed that we've had the company of um, Mrs. Yule Williams in the audience for the whole day. Uh, I have known her for a number of years, and she has been a supporter of the arts. Uh, Mrs. Yule Williams, thank you for your support. Uh, so, uh, welcome again this afternoon. The engine room that is behind this organization is led by Marina Salande Brown. I would like to welcome Salande Brown to her own feast. <laughs> <laughs> so, Salande Brown, welcome. And all the other hardworking members of the team, wherever you are in the room or outside the room, we can't do any of this without all of you. So I acknowledge your support and your uh, hard work. I also acknowledge the presence of um, uh, the uh, High Commissioner for Jamaica, who is in the audience, Mr. Pendergrass, and, and who is going to be uh, our host on Sunday. I've already told him that every writer who is on the ground is looking forward to that evening, that Jamaican hospitality. So uh, welcome, sir, and thank you for being here. Uh, we have members of our board uh, in the audience. I won't name, I call all the names, uh, but I want to say thank you to all of them, and I want also to say thank you to the writers who have made this possible. But above all, thank you to the audience. As I always tell people, it is one thing to give a feast. It is another thing to have people come in to partake of the feast with you. So if you lay out a table and there are no participants, your feast will be useless. So members of the audience, I thank you very, very much. Uh, a number of people have asked me if I am intimidated in, uh, in being selected to interview uh, Dr. Keith Rowley. And I told them nothing intimidates me. Ex except God. <laughs> okay. So, and I'm sure uh, he will be very, very comfortable um, talking with me, and uh, we see how it goes. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to allow him to read a short passage, and then we will hold a conversation, and then he will cl close with another short passage. And, uh, but in between, if we have time, I think I, your, uh, uh, your um, public relations officer said you are okay with questions from the audience. Okay. So uh, we, we also allow uh, questions from the audience. But please, if you haven't read the book, <laughs> okay, I, I don't have to complete that sentence <laughs> because this is about he as the writer, uh, about him as a writer. So, uh, 
Dr. Kate Rowley. If you want, you want to read from this position, if you are cool here, that's why. So we will listen to him read. Oh. Well, thank you very much. I would like uh, at first to thank all the organizers of this festival for affording me the opportunity of doing something I never did before. I always uh, notice this festival in the newspapers and I always want to go and never got around to going because something always got in the way. And I got up this morning and I almost uh, gave instructions to let you know I couldn't make it because there's so many things coming my way. And, but eventually I thought there might be at least one person in the audience who might have been looking forward to hearing me read what I wrote, and that person might have been disappointed. So I, I rushed in here from cabinet, which on a Thursday makes Thursday the busiest day. And I'm really happy to be here. I never thought that the first time I would visit the Lit Fest, I would be reading to writers. I'm not really a writer. I'm not really a politician. I'm a geologist. <laughs> Lennox will understand that, right? I'm a geologist, and um, I'm going to read from page 54-55 on the subhead, My Common Entrance Near Miss. I was in my 11 plus year in 1961, and as general elections issues took center stage, and dominated the village conversation, education became a major subject and common entrance became a household phrase. By that time, my grandparents had already put Rita into Harmon High School of the Seventh-day Adventists in Scarborough and was struggling to pay the quarterly school fees. Even at that age, I would frequently be required to assist my grandmother with catching about a dozen of our best yard fowls, tying them up, putting them on a wooden tree, placing it on my head, and setting off along the road to offer the fowls for sale to raise cash to pay school fees. It was against this background of intimate knowledge of the anxieties, stresses, and strains of providing a secondary education to a child that my grandparents absorbed the promise of free secondary education offered as a fundamental pillar of PNM policy. My grandfather, in addition to intently following radio broadcasts of the proceedings of the Legislative Council, attended a couple of the election meetings in Mason Hall and Scarborough in 1961. And upon his return, my grandmother would question him about who were there, who spoke, and what was said. On one occasion, in answer to her inquiry about what Dr. Eric Williams talked about, my grandfather replied, he talked about the boy. It took me a long time to fully understand what he meant, but I knew they all voted PNM in 1961 and A. N. R. Robinson, who contested a parliamentary election once again, had come away with a handsome victory to the consternation of A. P. T. Fargo James, whom he defeated. To the shock of everyone, the long-serving Fargo passed away soon after the general election of 1961, and I entered Bishop's High School in January 1962 as a student of common entrance to receive free secondary education. But it could have turned out so differently. There was tremendous academic competition in primary school, and I always placed first or second in tests. I had to sit the common entrance exam in 1961 to enter secondary school in January 1962. Our headmaster, Beardy, 
had told us that we all had to write this new common entrance exam, but that Mason Hall students had to go to Bishop's High School in Mount Mary Scarborough to write it. Before the exam, they selected students to put into a special class taught by Mr. Winchester of Bell Garden to prepare for this examination. I was selected, and all selected students had to be registered by a school supervisor who came in from Trinidad. During vacation time, it was rainy season I think, I came down with a terrible chest cold. It was rattling on my chest, and it was so bad I couldn't attend school. I was 11 years old then, and our neighbor Wilfred Jack, who was from Lekoto, had friends in Plymouth who made shark oil. He journeyed there to obtain some, and I was fed unrefined shark oil with lemon juice from the rough lemon tree. It wasn't pleasant, but three weeks later, I was able to return to school. As a result of having missed these weeks, the teachers retained me in the Standard 4 class. Mr. Baird, the jovial, avuncular, diligent, consummate headmaster that he was, came into my class on one of his daily rounds and saw me there. At once he realized that I would not have been registered for the common entrance exam. And in those days, students had one chance to sit and pass. He was alarmed. The school supervisor had already visited, compiled his list, and left. Mr. Baird immediately grabbed me out of the class and led me to his vehicle, a Zephyr with license plate number P1850. He drove off with me at top speed to find the school supervisor, Mr. Bartolo, to get my name on the list. Mr. Bartolo was staying in government's quarters at the old government farm. When we arrived there, the house was locked up. Mr. Baird, a large fatherly man, was now distraught and despondent, was almost in tears. Seeing him in that state made me very sad. As he was about to turn around the car to leave, a window opened, and there was Mr. Bartolo, shaving cream on his face and a towel around his waist. Mr. Baird, one foot on the car and the other on the ground, sprung up to his full height and shouted over the roof of the car, I have one of my best students here. I want to put his name on the list. Mr. Bartolo, razor in hand, shaving cream in the other, shouted back, What's his name? His name is Keith Rowley. Okay, I will put him on the list. I was only a little worried because there was an upside to all this. I was thinking that if I didn't get on the list, I would not get into the special class, and I would escape the regimentation and the possible encounter possible encounters with a certain heavy leather strap called Branco that was part and parcel of that distinguished gathering. There was a frightening story making the rounds at the time that Branco was soaked in pee on weekends so as to maintain maximum mass and operational flexibility with a slight sting but left no lasting marks on the body. I thought Mr. Bartolo might forget, but he didn't. Long afterwards, I realized how close I came to having a different life. The day of the exam arrived. Winston's father, John Harrell, owned a green Ford Council. Having a car in those days and a new one at that was a big thing. We were scheduled to write the exam at Bishop's High School at 8 a.m. on the appointed day. It was previously arranged that John Harrell would take Winston and me by car to write the exam. All village children who had to sit the exam that morning woke early and left at 6.30 a.m. Winston and I were left waiting for this car to take us. Lo and behold, the car wouldn't start. Trouble now. 
John Harrell started to sweat. Half past seven, and Winston and I were still in Mason Hall. The car simply would not start, no matter what John Harrell and other mechanics tried. Desperate, he flagged down a passing car to take us. But by now it was five minutes to eight. We reached the school at half past eight. All children were in the yard playing. The exam came in parts, and we knew the first part had been completed. We resigned ourselves that we had failed the big exam. When we entered the school and inquired, we discovered that the plane bringing the exam papers from Trinidad was late. So the start of the exam had been delayed. As it turned out, the exam did not begin until 2 p.m. It was a very close call. When results came, Mason Hall did very well. I passed for Bishop's High School and Winston Harrell went to Scarborough Secondary. My partner Bud, Angela Henry and Colleen Gray were among the elatedly successful few who would go on to town school at Bishop's High School. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to start my questioning from the piece you've just read. Uh, if you combine that piece with a number of other pieces in the book, uh, one thing that is immediately obvious is that um, you, Lady Locke has all phone been on your side. And uh, my question is, um, now looking back at your life, how much of it do you credit to Locke and how much to your tenacity of purpose and your tenacity of will? Well, I think, I don't know if it was just fate. And luck must have played a part. But I play golf, right? Mm -hmm. As you know. Yes. <laughs> and a great golfer was said to be very lucky. But he always said, the more I practice, the luckier I get. But I didn't practice any of this to get any of that luck from practice. So I just think it was just pure fate. Um, another thing that struck me in the book is the fact that um, you have almost you, uh, an appointment with water and fire. And those of you who have read the book, we know that um, he nearly burnt down their home in Mason Hall, and he was nearly swept away with, uh, with, by flood water with, with his grandfather, and then Flora, it was Hurricane Flora, uh, nearly um, had a negative impact on his life. What is it with you, with, uh, with fire and water? I don't know. I mean, when I was a child, I, I just loved to set fires. I mean, I just... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we grew up in the countryside, and there were always combustible material around. And my brother and I were just very, very mischievous. So we were always carrying matches in the dry season. And there was nothing better than starting a fire and just watch it consume the dry stuff. And, you know, it was just our idea of fun, but it was a very destructive habit. And we kind of got very close to getting into very serious trouble. It's amazing how when you're a child, these things look like fun, but they were extremely dangerous. And I only realized that when I grew up, how dangerous it was. And then water, I mean, our village, we had, the Colin River runs through our village, and it was an integral part of whatever we do. And we virtually um, grew up in the river until the two tragedies that I mentioned in the book. Two of my colleagues got drowned in the river. And, but the river was like our backyard. And we crossed it to go to the farm, we bathed there, we got water there for drinking and whatever. So whatever happened in the river was part of our life. Well, uh, those, uh, since there are so many writers in the audience, uh, what, uh, while I was reading it, I was saying to myself, wow, uh, if this were to be a book of fiction, 
that the metaphor of fire and water would be very, very powerful thread running through it. But from the little I know of your life, it looks as if that metaphor is a consistent part of your life. Uh, is that a correct assessment? Well, now that you've put it that way, maybe it is, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm always in, I'm always in, in, in trouble. Uh-huh. And of course, you know, as rules say, fire, fire, bring water. Yeah. So. Okay, um, I, I need to talk with you about um, your writing process because uh, we are interested in that at this festival. Uh, if you don't mind, can you walk us through your writing process for this book? Uh, is it a combination of... Uh, start and stop or is it a combination is it a process of writing the whole thing straight through uh, what are the kind of challenges you faced uh, as much as uh, you can reveal to us well this book came about as a result of me finding myself taking part in the general election of 2015 because um Late 2014, we were pretty much, you know, in a, in a heightened expectation of a general election, and I was leading the opposition party. But there was something that bothered me all along, and that is, as I got more and more involved in public life, and I've been in public life for over 30 years, it kind of frustrated me that people who knew very little about me other than what they saw on the political platform or in my political presence were always talking about me as they should, but they didn't know very much about me. And there was one particular comment that got me really very upset. And it was one influence peddler who, I, did, I said something, and the comment that was written was that I have that position because of my middle class upbringing. And I was really annoyed at that because anybody who would describe me as middle class in any way obviously doesn't know anything about me. And I thought, if you're going to talk about me in that way, you should know something about me. But then again, here I was on the verge of a general election, expecting to win and to become prime minister of the country if I'm successful. And there were so many people who knew very little about me. And by know about me, I'm not talking about where I am politically or what I say politically. I'm talking about me. You said Keith Rowley, the, not the prime minister. I'm talking about Keith Rowley, the citizen, the person. And I said I would write something before the general election, which would, like a, a small booklet, which would allow people to see a bit beyond my political existence. But that was a wishful thought because as we got closer to 2015 and got into the campaign of 2015, even though I had the thought, I just never could find the time to sit down and write that and it was never done. And then we won the election and I became prime minister and I moved into the prime minister's residence. And my grandson is there with me and I still thinking that I'm prime minister and a lot of people in this country don't know anything about me. And I look closer and I'm saying, maybe my daughters don't know anything about me either. Because they were born when I came into the political business. And they, all their life they knew me as living this political existence. To the point where whenever I, I got to, when my younger daughter was about four or five, or probably six, seven. Every time I take up a towel or I go into the bathroom and I take up a towel, she'll come to me and she'll grab my leg and say, Daddy, are you going out? And sometimes I would luckily say, No, I'm going to bed. I'm just going to have a shower, go to bed. And they grew up like that. And I was thinking, maybe it's not just that writer who annoyed me, who doesn't know anything about me. Maybe my children don't know enough about me. And then here's my little grandson, and he's going to grow up not knowing anything about me. So you know what? I'm going to write so that they could read where they've come from and who I am. And that's what drove me to sit down. And I started to scribble a few things. But then I realized 
that if I'm going to do a book, I knew nothing about writing a book or producing a book. So I had to have help. And I spoke to Maxi Coffey, and he um, introduced me to Sheila Rampasad, and between both of them, they gave me the technical and editing assistance to produce this book. And it was really meant to allow persons, not only my family, but other persons, those persons whose business I interfere with at this time, to know exactly who I am and not just rely on what they've seen or heard of me in the political arena. Okay, what I'm hearing is that this, the decision to publish it in this version and this, uh, came after your winning of the elections. Uh, I wonder what, if you had lost that election, what would have been the fate of this book? Well, there would have been a chapter on the agony of defeat. <laughs> Excellent. Um, the next question I want to ask is that um, in the book, you reveal the fact that um, you cut your political teeth on the platform of NJAC and, and the ideology of NJAC. But as we all know, you eventually found your political home in PNM. Uh, what was that journey from the political, uh, the ideological sta uh, the stage of NJAC to that of PNM like? How, how, how did you negotiate that journey? And uh, if you care, what political ideology did it lead you to develop for yourself as a political animal? Well, my involvement in NJAC was. I followed one of my schoolmates who would come back from the Sir George William experience in Canada. And after listening to all that was being said by people like that, I became very aware of our attempt to uh, build a nation. And I started questioning whether we were achieving that objective. And I had no difficulty associating with what NJAC stood for, which is, um, put it, if, if I copy a statement, you know, you know what, that statement, Tobago for Tobagonians? Well, I guess there was certain, a certain element of that in NJAC at the time, in 1970, Trinidad and Tobago for Trinidad and Tobagonians, and therefore this colonial um, vestige that was still, what we say, was still oppressing us required to be cast off. And I felt that the PNM, while Dr. Williams recognized the need to be anti-colonial, the pace at which things were happening in Trinidad and Tobago, the change that we hankered after may never be accomplished, and certainly not in, my, in our lifetime. There was too much um, disparity, unfairness, and, and privilege in Trinidad and Tobago. And NJAC attacked those issues frontally. And then I got very close to being arrested, as you would have seen in the book. I, I missed being arrested. When, when the police came, I had just left. Because my grandfather was insisting that I get out of Tobago because I'd come back to Tobago from Trinidad with NJAC. And my grandfather was very upset because he was sure that I was going to get into trouble. And eventually, I decided to leave after the Gordon Grand Fire. And I left home like about seven o'clock to go on the boat. And probably about half past seven, the police came inquiring about me. And luckily, maybe they didn't believe my grandfather when he said I wasn't there because I was known to be there. And missing me by half an hour, I suspect they thought I was somewhere around. But I got to the boat and I came back to Trinidad. And um, some of my colleagues got caught up in the detention and I came that close to be there and I kind of went on the ground for a while went very quiet for a while and then I had to go to university and I moved on to the university and I still I carried into the university the scare of what happened in Trinidad with Anjak and I went on the campus and I did not take part in anything political on the campus I, I mean, I, you wouldn't believe that I was a platform speaker in 1970. I went to Mona campus and I just became politically dead. 
And when I came back to Trinidad and I looked at NJAC and the PNM, what we suspected about NJAC being a good idea, but not, have, not really knowing exactly where the next step was going to be or where we were going to end up, I then thought that if I was going to get involved in politics in a meaningful way, that the organized political entity of the PNM was a good place to put my effort. And I was encouraged by people who had been in the PNM. And I joined and became a member, and that was it. But uh, what would you say is your political ideology? I would simply think. If you, if you want to find a term, these terms tend to be either misunderstood, overplayed, or what. I would say that um, it's, it's, it's nationalistic. Because I, I, I am, I'm deeply proud of being part of this nation. And I'm extremely privileged to be part of what I consider to be the building of a nation. I mean, we're full of warts and prickles, but, you know, it's whatever it is, it's our nation. And I just am nationalistic. The other thing that um, struck me reading through the book is the fact that you are fulsome in your praise of the people who have been kind to you in life. You don't forget them. You praise them. Uh, but you are very hesitant to even name some of the people who did some what, what some people might say terrible things to you, except in one or two instances. For example, you didn't give us the name of the gentleman who came to uh, take away the car of, of, from the national quarries from you, and I thought I, I want to know the name of that person. My question is, your hesitancy in naming uh, the people who have had negative impacts, most, not all of them, most of the people who have had negative impacts on your life, is that the savvy politician at work because uh, they don't want to name names in case they have to work with such people in future when they become politically important? No, I don't think it's political. I think that's just how I am. You see, I believe that people who have to carry burdens of having behaved badly torture themselves. And I expect that if they are given an opportunity, after they realize what they've done, that they would probably go through worse than what I went through in when, when they dished out to me. The, the, the person who you mentioned, who you referred to, he wasn't named, but I'll tell you a funny story. I eventually joined Mocha Golf Course, the golf club where I play golf now. Okay. And there I met this gentleman. And he, he greeted me with, as if we never had that experience. Okay. And he passed away recently as one of my friends. And in the years we spent in that club, this issue never came up. And after he passed away, I told the story to a couple of people who could not believe that we've had that experience. And I believe that people can change if they are given an opportunity to change themselves. You would observe, I, and even in the, you mentioned the politics, there are people who have been very nasty to me in the politics. Many of them now enjoy very significant appointments because I believe that when they reflect on what they had done, they, if given another opportunity, they wouldn't do that. But maybe, maybe at the time they thought it was the best thing to do. And, um, you know, I, I, I take a long time to write people off. But I have a very bad habit. That if I write you off, you stay written off forever. <laughs> but I take a long time to do that. I, I give people second chances. But then if it, if, if it becomes to the point where I, regard, I figure I don't want any part of you, it becomes very difficult for me then to, to, to treat with you. 
but um, is, is, Margaret, is, is Margaret Lawrence still alive? Margaret Lawrence, you remember her? I haven't seen her for very, very many years, but her brothers are around still, and they were still very you good friends. You must tell them the story. <laughs> Here's a man who read the book, right? <laughs> we used to, well, we used to go home for lunch from school, and um, you know, it's funny. They used to have a kitchen in the school mm -hmm. where they prepared lunch for children who were supposedly in a position that required welfare. And we used to want to eat there because they made dumpling and salt fish and that was a great thing. But we used to have to go home for lunch and we, I don't know why because we were not by people of means at all. Sometimes we go home and all we have for lunch is a slice of bread and sugar dissolved in water. But there were lots of mango trees around and whatever. And sometimes as we visited these fruit trees, we would decide not to go back to school. So we were very um, regular beach breakers. Huh? And um, one day, this is the Winston I mentioned in the passage I read, Winston Harila, and my brothers, my younger brother, same fireman, right? we decided not to go back to school. But we had this teacher called Mr. Sampson, who was a real beater. And in those days, children were beaten, not spanked, beaten with guava rods. And our school had a guava patch across the fence. So they were real good, genuine go over us. But we decided to stay away from school and turn up about, probably about quarter past two, half past two, something like that. But before we got there, we got a cartoon box and we, um, and we broke it, took the side and put it in the back of our shirts because we knew that we were going to get a hiding. <laughs> so Mr. Mr. Samson was a bit of a drunk. So he put his thing on the board and then opened his bag with a coffee cup and poured out his rum and telling us his coffee. And then he'd go back to sleep on the desk. So we turned up while he was having his siesta, quarter past two. And he looked up at us in consternation, grabbed his whip and started to rain blues on us. And of course, it was echoing across the school, right? Bow, bow, bow. And we are there, you know, playing man, and we taking this licks, man. Bow, bow. And then Margaret, Margaret, sir, they're not feeling, <laughs> they have cardboard in their back. <laughs> he said, what? Check it out. And cardboard came out. And this man went berserk. And he gave us, now it will be called brutalization, gave us the most terrible looking. And, you know, the, the <laughs> Margaret I hold the responsibility for that all my life. <laughs> it was, when I got home, I couldn't take off my shirt because the blood had dried on my back and I had to peel the shirt off my back. But I had to beg my sister not to tell that I got licks. And of course, she agreed not to tell them. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and my father was over me, my grandfather was over me, my mother was over me, my, my grandmother was over me, and she was just smiling because she told them what happened in school and they came to find out and saw my condition. And my father decided, tomorrow morning, I'm going down to that school and there'll be one teacher less in that school. And my grandfather decided, you're not going down there, I'm gonna go down. And my grandfather put on his khaki suit. Dr. Riley, uh, can I interrupt? Sure. Don't finish that story. Let them go and read the book to see the end of that story. <laughs> see, it's a, a good storyteller. So, yeah, so let them go and read the book so they can find out how that issue is resolved. Um, before you uh, give us an, another short reading, uh, and the, this next question uh, requires a very simple answer. What is the nature of your current personal interactions? Personal interaction with the following people. Wade Mark. Very little, I, I, very little I, I don't see him, but when we meet, I mean, we are colleagues in the parliament for a long time, but we, um, we interact like colleagues. Okay. Mrs. Kamla Pasad Bisesa. Um, personal, eh? personal, personal interaction. Um, mm -hmm. not the, the only time I would say I had personal interaction with Mrs. Bisesa was when we did that trip to South Africa for Mandela's funeral. Okay. We had two days of real personal interaction. And finally, uh, Mrs. Verlin Allen Topping. None whatsoever. 
I will have nothing to do with them. If you have, if you have read the book, and if you, or if you follow the politics of Trinidad and Tobago, you will, you will understand why I am asking those questions. I'm going to change gear slightly, very slightly. Uh, the other thing I notice about this book is the number of silences. And I want to ask you why you were silent on a number of things. And there's one particular one that troubled me, and I will tell you why it, uh, it troubled me. Uh, if you want it before your answer or after your answer, it's fine by me. What did Patrick Manny bury in the, uh, on the beach at Stubby? Do you want me to tell you why I'm asking, or you just give me the answer? Didn't I, didn't I say what it was? No, it's, it's something valuable to him. You that, said. No, um, actually, it was a it was a firearm. Ah, I thought uh, that was my. Uh, yeah, it was. Even it, it first. Then. It was a firearm. Yeah. Okay, I thought it was either a firearm or a cross. No, no, we were going into the sea, and and, and well, of course, if you lose your firearm, you know you're in big trouble. Mm -hmm. So he be buried in the sun and in the middle of the dark night, it's hard to find. But <laughs> yeah. Okay. The other uh, silence uh, that I saw in the book, uh, you didn't tell us the nature of your disengagement from UWI. You just said you moved on to something. It was, it was just, was there any, no, were you I, I dissatisfied no, no, with no, no, the UWI? No, not at all. Actually, as a matter of fact, the, the greatest period of satisfaction in my life was that which I spent in UWI. I went in as a student in 1970, and I spent my formative years there, and I, I went straight on to staff, and I left there as head of a department. And I, I really enjoyed the job I did there, and I really enjoyed being at UWI. As a matter of fact, if, if, if I may comment, I, I look now at UWI, and I feel very disappointed in very many ways, but the days when I was there, and Irvin Hall and Mona, I would say that was probably the peak of my development. I was in Jamaica, Mona, um, when Michael Manley came on the scene, and uh, Peter Tush was the rhythm guitarist in Bob Marley's band, and the Students' Union was the place to be. You know, I, I, so I, I have very, very pleasant memories of UWI. Thanks. And the last uh, example of the silence I want to look at is, um, uh, when I started to read the book, I said to myself, this was my opportunity to find out how the government works in Trinidad and Tobago and what you brought to that governance system. The only example I saw of that was your relating, your growing up in Tobago, an agricultural island, and your ministership in agriculture and the fact that that helped you to negotiate the uh, agriculture uh, you didn't really give too much insight into the uh, the dynamics of the government of the cabinet that you were in uh, the intricacies of the cabinet and um, situation and I was wondering if you are holding those for post prime minister uh, uh, position I don't know. Maybe I might write again, but I, I have taken no such decision. But um, maybe I would, because one of the things in our community, our national community, is that not enough people um, put on the record what should be on the record. For example, it's a pity that Patrick Manning wasn't able to write something. Every time I see Bazi Opande, I say to him, when are you going to write something? And he tells me he's, he's writing something. I don't know what it is. You know, Bazi might be, might be a joke. But, he, but really, people who've had that experience could enrich the society by writing. Even if those who come after and read what you write would criticize you, as I've been criticized on this book for not answering all these questions. But the book is, what, 200 and odd pages? I set out to write something that you could read in a couple of nights. And if I had written all those things, it would have been about a thousand pages. Um, so there's room for, for, for writing. I don't know what the end is gonna be. But it is imp it's important that persons who want to um, 
who've, who've had the opportunity to, to live the lives that we have lived here, and it doesn't have to be office holders, but especially office holders. I didn't write about the cabinet because as I said early on, the, the main reason for writing the book was to give a little insight into me, Let, allow people to know a little bit more about me. And therefore, the stories about the cabinet, of which there are many, didn't really make the cut. Uh, uh, could you give us um, your second piece of reading now, or do you want to take questions from the audience first? Yeah, let me take a few questions. Or, or do you want me to read the last piece? Uh, how do you want it? You are read? read? <laughs> okay. Democracy at work. That means you don't have any questions. Right? Okay. Well, I, I picked these pieces randomly. I just opened the book, and I, I, I'm going to read my first visit to Trinidad. The first time I visited Trinidad, I was about eight years old. I suffered culture shock. We didn't have street lights in Mason Hall, and Trinidad was so bright with lights everywhere. My mother was renting an apartment in John John Laventil, and there were lights in her home too. I would wait eagerly for the electric lights to be turned on at evening time. So intrigued was I. On the occasions I visited for Christmas, I was doubly happy to see the multicolored Christmas lights on the Christmas tree that transformed my mother's home and the entire neighborhood. In Mason Hall, we didn't have pipe-borne running water either. We collected water from the nearby streams at Dinette Gully, Adelphi Gully, or from distant standpipes. The nearest one was more than two miles away. We had three huge coppers, about eight feet in diameter, for collecting rainwater and for storage. Sometime later, a water main was laid about a mile from us, and over a period of many years, a distribution system was constructed to incrementally serve the whole village. I experienced running water at home only when I came to Trinidad, after I completed high school in Tobago. Unsurprisingly, Vasi, was sharing a house with three other families. It was two stories tall with two apartments on the ground floor and two on the upper floor. That arrangement was totally unknown to us in Tobago, where a family lived in a house and there were no strangers in that house. Here was my mother living in accommodation that she shared with strangers, living in the downstairs apartment where being peed upon by the upstairs child inhabitant was not an infrequent occurrence. My mother didn't only share this home with strangers, but she also shared toilet facilities with them. There was a block outside with a row of kitchens, one for each family who occupied the house. Across the dirt courtyard and a little away from the four kitchens was a huge, evil-smelling latrine precariously perched on the edge of a garbage-filled ravine. In Tobago, we had latrines too, but those were ours. No one but our family used our latrine, and in Tobago, they were neat and frequently sprayed with crude oil. There was even a job called sanitary inspector, which was populated by, a zealous, office, by zealous officers who regularly came in their white shirts to inspect their charges. Certain families had been known to run afoul of the sanitary inspector, and when such word got out, the rest of the village reacted by avoiding an offer of drinking water from any such household. The accommodation in Laventil was a tight fit. People lived close to one another in cheek-by-jowl arrangements. I would go to Belmont to visit cousins, and it felt like people in Trinidad were living in a sardine tin. I was appalled. I didn't like it one bit, and I thought to myself that if this was Trinidad, I didn't want to live here. In Tobago, the air was clean without sewer smell. There was open space around each house, and we were always cultivating something around the yard, either for food or for floral beauty. An Indian, an Indian family living up the hill from my mother's apartment in Laventil had a boy my age 
He owned pigeons, which, were off, which we often flew together. It was from his family that I first tasted a real curry. Curried chicken in thick, spicy gravy. We had curry in Tobago, of course, but we used it in our food to add a little flavor. Curry was turban brown, and it came over in paper packs that resembled chili baby packets. A fat packet sold for two or three cents. Rita knew how to cook curry, and while we ate mostly provisions, she loved rice and would sometimes sprinkle a little curry in hot rice. That was a treat for us. But we didn't have autonomous curry dishes like curried chicken or curried goat and ducks or few and far between. In fact, all poultry were kept open range and they ran freely around the yard and slept in a tree of their choice in the owner's yard. The few ducks that, that were around were thought to be nasty and had a favorite, and not a favorite dish since they spent nearly all their time gobbling and scavenging in drains. In our very large and dispersed family, only Tante Mary, my father's elder sister, reared ducks, and she couldn't even give them away to us. My father was a very scornful man, and even though he raised many yard fowls, he would have nothing to do with them as a source of meat. So you could imagine what he thought of ducks, even when his favorite sister tried to share her culinary delights with him. When the Indian family in John John was cooking their curried meals, the flavor would spread all over the hill. Curried food was new and exciting to me. The smell alone announced that it was good food. During my visits to my mother, we would talk a lot and laugh hard together. She was a walking dictionary of humorous idioms, which I'm sure she picked up from my, grandfather, my grandparents while growing up in Tobago. She was raucous and had a tremendous sense of humor. Vasi was very proud of me, and we got along very well. She loved Christmas too, and up until she died, we would argue about curtains. She would buy new ones for Easter and new ones again for Christmas, then pack those away and the next year buy new ones again. I would tell her, you're working too hard to waste your money on reaching the cloth merchants. But she insisted. Pretty new curtains for her was a sure sign of her success and pride. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, any questions from the audience? If not, I will continue. <laughs> the audience? Okay. Thank you. Good evening, all. I didn't read the book, Dr. Rowley, but I will. I did, however, found your title, the title of the book to be inspirational. And I was wondering if when you were writing the book, if you're taking cognizance of the fact that maybe by opening a window into your life that you could be opening minds, particularly the young men and women of Trinidad and Tobago, of what is possible. I think as I spent the very late nights because you did ask me how long it took and I sat up many many nights after work writing this because that sentiment got over me and got a hold of me that if there are young people who read this and they wanted to know if they had a chance in this cauldron then if I could have made it through those conditions maybe I could give them hope that they could make it too and that helped me get through it and then I, a sense of urgency got around. I wanted to get it finished as quickly as possible. Come get your copy, come. Come, I'll give you this. Yeah, that, that was, because you know, I, I wasn't, a privileged person, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed where I was located in the society. And sometimes I think if I have to grow up again, I'll want to grow up the same way I grew up. But you shouldn't put a lid on how high you want to climb. And there was something I was uh, made familiar with, I grew up with in Tobago, something called ambition. When I was a boy in Tobago, the worst thing that could happen to you is for somebody to accuse you, an adult, to accuse you of not having any ambition. That means you were 
worse than worthless. So we all wanted to, in simple parlance, to be something, to do something better. And now as I'm in government, and I've been around public life for a long time, and we talk about development, I look at development and is the next generation doing better than us and the last one? And if the children can do better than the parents, then we're being developed. And I hope that some child might read that book and see what I was able to achieve with the help of a lot of people. Eh? Because, I mean, it's not that I was better than, I think I said it in the book, I mean, I have five brothers and they were all brighter than I was. But there was no public policy to assist them the way I was assisted at the time when they grew up. I was the last one. I was the youngest one. So public policy is important, and individuals need to set goals for themselves. And that's what I think the book represents. Dr. Rowley, we are here from Karaku, and I'm sure you'd appreciate that. Karaku, Tools Bay. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. And I'm sure you would appreciate the sense of pride we feel because we draw parallelism between Karakou and Grenada and Trinidad and Tobago. We tell people, well, if you don't understand what Karakou is, it's the equivalent of Tobago to Grenada. You know, beautiful beaches, beautiful people. But I wonder, Dr. Rowley, um, have you traced any connections? Because we have lots of connections and similarity with Tobago. I couldn't say I have, but I've been to Karakou and, uh, you know, I, I, I experienced that similarity. So, but I, I don't know that um, there's been any historical connection, but there are great similarities. Uh, before the next question, uh, something as he mentioned, um, tracing connections. Uh, if I remember correctly, your maternal line is Anu. Is that, is that, is that, is that am I correct? Yes. yes. Because if, you, um, if, if it is what I think it is, then it's directly from the Yoruba people of Nigeria. Because Anu uh, is um, mercy, the mercy of God. It's called Anu Olua, the mercy of God. So maybe you, you need to go to Nigeria to trace some of your roots. <laughs> well, the good thing about that is that the, the, the Tobago's um, slave records are virtually complete. Mm -hmm. Actually, the actual records were on display in Tobago last year. Um, and um, Anu was the registered slave. On what I found interesting about that was that from my own understanding of uh, uh, the records in Tobago, not too many Yoruba people went to Tobago. Most of them came to Trinidad. So when I saw the name, I said, wow, this is interesting. This is a line of investigation that needs to be taken seriously. Uh, somebody wanted to ask a question. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm Joanna Furlong Walker. Um, good evening, Mr. Raleigh. Good evening. While you were speaking from your book, which I haven't read, um, something came into my mind, a poem, which I think some of the audience might remember. Lives of great men all remind us. We can make our lives sublime. And departing, leave behind us footprints on the sand of time. I can't go any further, I don't remember clearly the other verse. But I'm thinking that perhaps when you come to write again or encourage your colleagues to write, that that would be the choice, the name of your book, Lives of Great Men. <laughs> and, and then I would dare not mention my name in there. <laughs> We have room for one last question. Is Nalis in the house, by the way? Yes. Okay. One question, and then I'm going to call Nalis. There's somebody right behind you. Um, good day, Dr. Rowley. Good, good evening. Um, I can imagine you are the busiest man in China and Tobago, and so many people here aspire to write. And, you know, a lot of us say that we're too busy to write, you know. Um, how were you able to carve out that time, that space of mental sanity to really go back and reflect and, and, and do all that searching to put together this work? Um, the only 
useful advice I could give you on that is try sitting down to write between midnight and daybreak. And you'd be amazed what comes through your head. Because I found when I would write this text, I would sit down and sometimes I get myself into the script and I'm not writing, I'm just sitting there thinking and pretty much reliving it. It's like speaking on the platform. People say to me, well, how come you manage to go on the platform and speak without a script? I like talk for two hours sometimes. And for me, it's relatively easy. You think you got something to say? Just say it. You got something to write? Just sit down and write it. Okay? And do it that time of day. And there's something inspirational about the quiet of the night. Especially if you have an open window to look through from time to time. I cannot miss this opportunity. And I'm going to ask my very last question, Prime Minister Dr. Rowley. Uh, now that you are a writer and understanding what Boca's Lit Fest stands for, we stand for ideas that make us better. We stand for stories that tell our realities. We stand for images that mirror ourselves. Are you likely to give full support to our lobby? <laughs> like you all anticipated the question already. Are you likely to give full support to our lobby for your government to remove the tax on books? I, I thought you said you were talking to me. Excuse me. Well, as so, a writer, will you give your full support? Well, I, no, okay, so, so because I wrote a book, I'm a writer. Okay. That's why you're on this stage. <laughs> is there a writer's registry? <laughs> well, no. Um, it is something worth considering because I was a little, I was a little disappointed. Um, I didn't write this book for profit, but I must say, I when just when I got the idea and said, "Look, I'm going to do it," without telling that to a, a book dealer. Mm -hmm. In a, in a conversation that I started, he said to me that, you know, many books only get into the bookshop by a dozen copies. And I said, not really. And he said, yeah. A lot of books, the bookshop will only take and sell about 12 copies. And it kind of bothered me that we invest so heavily in education and in schools. And I'm an old time person. I'm, I'm really very conservative and I bought a Kindle I read it for about a week and then I closed it and put it under my bed since then and I prefer to read pages I go into a bookshop and I can't come out empty handed but then I discovered that so many people in our community just don't read and I suspect that that has a great contribution to the incompleteness of our society. So if anything can be done to encourage reading, then you have my support. Thank you. Uh, I mean reading books. Can I, can I get my books signed, please? Uh, Nalis is... Um, um, a, a body that celebrates writing and every year they celebrate first time authors and uh, Dr. Kate Rowley F-U-N-S-O F-U-N-S-O -S yeah <laughs> and um, Nalis would like to recognize um, his um, elevation to the level of a first time author, and we have the pleasure of having Neil Personal, Chairman Nalis, to present token to him. Thank you.
Every year, NALIS, well, for the last two years, NALIS has been presenting first-time authors with a token of our appreciation. Yesterday, we celebrated that occasion again, and we presented 36 other first-time authors. One person was missing, the 37th author, first-time author in Trinidad and Tobago for last year, Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley. He now joins 267 other authors who we have registered and we will continue to register. And he will, his name will also be inscribed as among the authors of Trinidad and Tobago. And it is on that note I take great pleasure in presenting him this plaque which we awarded to everyone else, to Dr. Keith Rowling. Uh, all I need to do is to thank Dr. Kit Rowley for coming and giving us such a warm presentation. Um, then I think all of you enjoyed it. But um, to show you the fact that you enjoyed it, go out and buy copies. And he is willing to autograph one or two. Uh, so if you have yours on you. And we don't want to take him to the author's table, so I think you just do it right inside here. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> so but before that start, please let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much for the opportunity to spend the afternoon with you. Thank you very much for having me in your program.